Welcome to the Cruise Y1000, version 13.02. Press the regular key at the bottom right corner of the keypad for assistance. Welcome. Um, I'll do a few introductory remarks, get started with what's new in the release that we're going to talk about, which is Cruise Y1000, version 13. Um, and I will Stop and invite questions on a fairly regular basis. You can also just sort of jump in and say something if you'd like. But it might be easier for everybody if basically I pause after certain remarks. We um, haven't done a release in a few years, and for that, I'm sorry. I would like to have done one more frequently. And uh, there are very reason, various reasons why that has happened. One is simply that we are responsible for a number of other products, and we have to get those done in their various turns. Another, as some of you know, is that I was sort of out of commission for a while due to a um, accident between a bicycle and a van, and I was on the bicycle. In general, if you have to get into an accident, it's a good idea if you are in the bigger vehicle, not the smaller one. Since I was in the smaller one, I was in the hospital for a while, and it's taken a while for me to recover. Nonetheless, I'm very pleased with this particular release. I'm also pleased to say that I will be that basically the way releases like this are done is with the cooperation and active involvement of the customer base. So, if in fact there are features that you like. You can let us know. If there are features that you think are missing that you really, really wish you had, really let us know. That's the more important sort of thing, information. Uh, and if there are ways in which we can be helpful, we will attempt to do so. One of the things that's fairly new is that um, I may be able to do updates on a somewhat more regular basis than I have in the past. Um, there was a strange little legal requirement in the past that meant that I could do patches, but I could not actually put in new features between major releases. That is no longer true, and um, you know, with the appropriate people's permission, I may actually be able to do a 13.01 and .02, etc., that actually have interesting functionality inside of them. We can hope that that will be the case, and, um, and we'll see. So it's in version 13. Uh, the introduction that was just done sort of kindly indicated that I was an expert in optical character recognition. Once upon a time, that was actually true. In the 80s and mid-80s, I led the development of that work at Kurzweil Computer Products, which was for quite a while the only real shop in the world that was doing omnipod optical character recognition. Um, I am pleased for everybody's sake that I am no longer such an expert. There are a handful of companies that do very serious work in optical character recognition, and I can just sort of look at what they've produced in amazement and say, whoa, that, they are way beyond where we were some number of years ago. Well, that is simply because computers are faster, but some of it is because the nice thing about development in general is you learn from the past, either your own mistakes or uh, someone else's mistakes, what you've done well and can, would like to continue doing. And OCR, as currently practiced, is dramatically better than what it was many years ago. That is also a fundamental reason why people should think about upgrading now and then. If we did nothing else but upgrade the OCR, it is a good idea to pay attention to the various improvements that people make to OCR because it continues to get better. Um, in addition to just sort of getting better in general, the thing that happens is that the problem space tends to change tends to change over time. Um, once upon a time, what OCR meant was scanning what a person typed into a typewriter, for those of you who remember what typewriters were. Um, 
that had been true for a number of years. We've been doing things like books, magazines, newspapers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the fonts continue to change. The styling continues to change. The technology used to make the marks on paper changes. And all that stuff is things that you would like OER people to pay attention to. Luckily for you, they do. A particularly important thing in the last several years has been the development of new sources for images that you want to get recognized. I'm uh, referring primarily to document cameras. Document cameras have now become a fairly big thing, and they will probably be a bigger thing. I think in some respects we're still sort of you know, not exactly at the beginning of this sort of opportunity, uh, but it will continue to get better and more interesting. The images produced by those devices have certain characteristics that have changed the nature of the problem that OCR is designed to solve. And so more up-to-date OCR is likely to do a better job with document cameras than an older OCR. Current version, version 13 is using um, at Fine Reader, version 10. Who wants to ScanSoft version 18? We, for some reason, call it ScanSoft. Other people call it OmniPage. Uh, there are various old legal reasons why we stuck with what was their old name, not their new name, but nonetheless, same technology. So, OmniPage version 18, ScanSoft version 10, those are built into the product, and that actually is fairly important. The list of recognition languages has changed a little bit. The list of output formats for the uh, OCR utility application that is included in the product have also changed a bit. In general, new OCR can be an important thing. Number two, I'm going in a particular order here, but uh, these are some of the things that I think are important. This version of Kurzweil 1000 supports the ability to read and to write EPUB. EPUB is a file format that probably a lot of you know about already. It actually relates technically to DAISY. In fact, it's sort of derived from much of the same effort that produced DAISY. Uh, however, EPUB has really taken off in the marketplace. There are a lot of sources of EPUB documents. There are a lot of repositories of EPUB documents. And being able to, be able to read them is becoming increasingly important. After I did a reader, I was quickly told I needed to do something that wrote EPUB as well. The primary reason for that was really very simple. In the blogs business, in this business, all products are coming in particularly the portable ones. Uh, what's important increasingly is things like um, the, I have one so I can't, I'm blanking on the name, the iPhone. The iPhone is important. The iPad is important. Those kinds of devices are extremely well designed, and they're becoming important. In the blog business, they're also important because screener capability and a fairly significant degree of accessibility is more or less built in. And increasingly, there are applications that you can purchase for an iPhone that give you access on the go to various books and documents. And at least one of the important formats that they need to support is EPUB. And as a consequence, you can write EPUB in Kurzweil 1000 and then send that EPUB document across to something else and end up being reading it, reading it in, for example, iBooks on a uh, iPhone or on an, an iPad. And that's important and really quite useful. In terms of functionality, opening and reading a um, an EPUB document and I'll do that right now for those those of you who are uh, File. able to see this. File. Has a new control plus set. One or more. The selected folder is 
well educational systems, documents, e3 at EUB. First, two, wired for love. Move or the white whale. EP. Deck. I remember the source of this. I probably should have thought about that. It's, of course, a very big book. As a consequence, it takes a little while to come up. We're close, but not quite there. An EPUB document is one file. Unlike Daisy, three hundred twenty-two. Table ERTB width equals nineteen DMT index equals zero style equals a handle equals zero x four hundred escape. I wonder what went to page three hundred and twenty-two. That's simple. As usual, the uh, first page bookmark took effect. Bookmarks do work in EPUB documents, and so do most other functionality that you might be interested in. And you can certainly read, browse, uh, navigate, act, and do the various other things that you might normally expect to be doing. Chapter GI. The first day, night, in the mid watch, when the old man is what at intervals stepped forth from the scuttle in which he leaned and went to his pivot hole. He suddenly thrust out his face fiercely, snuffing up the Sierra's association. The bookmark. Chuck Chi. Chief's birthday. Did have bookmarks that night. I'm kind of amused at the pronunciation of Roman numerals. That was C X X X I I I, or for those of you really informed, that would be chapter 133, and it, uh, it made an attempt to pronounce it, which was at least kind of amusing. Epilogue, page 338. Plus, it's reasonably easy, as you can see. And basically, this is the same thing as, as you know, opening the other document. But in particular, it's really very similar to Daisy. Now, if you had an EPUB document that you were going to read over time, and you're going to read it in Kurzweil 1000, you really might want to save it as a KESI file. In general, KES is a format that we read and open very quickly, save very quickly, and it becomes sort of a default format if you're going to access something repeatedly again and again. However, the ability to access the wealth of information that is available through EPUB is a feature, and it's a really very important thing to be able to do. The ability to write EPUB is primarily useful in that you can send that document well, pretty much anywhere, and you can use it on anything that is capable today of reading EPUB. And the list of things that are capable of reading EPUB is likely to continue to grow. I pause now for any questions. Still doing the next system? Here. Yeah. I'm actually hearing a question. I think I'm just hearing crosstalk. True? Yeah, I think that was just somebody with noise in the background. Milton, I think. Milton? Yeah. <laughs> Milton, do you have a question? I have a question. Are, is the quality yeah. pretty much equal in all? EPUB documents, or is it similar to CAF where you have some documents that are basically pictures that need to be, you need to do AR on? Question. Uh, EPUB is really much more similar to a DAISY than it is to PDF. It's not primarily a format where you can, that you can use to gather images. And certainly the text that you're going to see in an EPUB document is very likely to be real text. And so in general, you'll find EPUB documents to be quite accessible. Thank you. Sure. And I'll move on. I'll just actually to say something that's just something that's associated with uh, EPUB, but with various other reasons, um, which is the file properties dialog. File, new, curl plus that, properties from Moby Dick or the white whale.epuv in folder 
slash users backslash spam can be learning backslash documents backslash APUB. Sign 4308992. is not terribly different from what you've seen before. There is size. And time, Thursday, June 14th, 2012, 2 13 p.m. Wait and time. Description. A description field, and by the way, you could fill these out if you wanted to. A lot of EPUB documents come with synopses, and you would have a synopsis here that describes the document. File is not read only. Attribute, no big deal. Lation, C backslash uses backslash SBUM can be learning, but title, be dick. I didn't actually want to hear the location again since it's rather lengthy, but that, of course, is the folder that the file was found in. Or the one and it's something new. Herman Melville. Uh, this is part of the metadata that you'll get with a EPUB document. Note, though, that most many of these fields are available in other documents too. For example, open a Kessie document, and you'll have these fields in them. Believe you can fill in and save it and and keep if they you find them useful or interesting. Keywords. <laughs> Keywords is actually used in uh, searches in large repositories. There happen that ha doesn't happen to have been filled out here, but nonetheless, that's often there. <laughs> For status, there's really a few choices. Scanned. Edit. Edited. Finished. This is actually a field for your use that can allow you to, uh, you know, basically pay attention to where you are in a document. However, for an EPUB document, the status is always going to be finished. We're going to make the presumption it's done. I require FE8 scheme. Pass. I require scheme are uh, highly technical and just have to do with with the. Uh, with the EPUB itself. They're not really a big deal. But if you are creating an EPUB document from scratch, you might want that field in order to fill it out yourself. Hard to say. Uh, properties. Now move on. I'll start talking about acquiring images. We, of course, we used to call scanning, uh, but in fact, the things that we use nowadays aren't always scanners. Um, and in particular, what I'm going to use for the moment, I'll close no. this. No, has been closed. I have, and I'll put no. settings, settings down voices. In the scanning dialog. None recognize. It looks pretty much the way it has been. I will point out a couple changes by uh, tabbing through this dialog. This is the scanner settings dialog. Automatic page orientation will be used. Dynamic thresholding will be used. Scanner brightness is 50. The between repeated scans is 5 seconds. Selected scanner source is Hover Cam T5. Cam is one of the document cameras and is one of the ones that we know the most about. So it's one that would definitely be high in our list of recommended um, cameras. This is something that you can buy today fairly readily from a sites like Amazon. And um, this is the Hover Cam T5, which is available in general for $279. It is a 5 megapixel camera, and overall, we highly recommend it. It, it works really quite well. Um, and is really very nice. There is also a Hovercam T5. The thing that is, di uh, I'm sorry, T5V. The V stands for visual. It is a version of the Hovercam that they have, are trying to aim towards the market of people with visual impairments. It has two additional things, which I'll talk about a little bit later, that you might find useful for about $40 more. $319, uh, it tends to be 319 Now, one other hover cam, a T3. I do not recommend the T3. It is much lower resolution. It is really for a device that's going to rely on optical character recognition. Uh, the center resolution will be 240 dots per inch. 
Those of you who know Kurzweil 1000 inside and out, Revision used to be for standard source, not after it. It is now after it. Is resolutions that are available to you are going to depend upon what your scanner source is, so we want you to trip across that one first. So, today, and I, in fact, I cannot change this. And by the way, the resolution of a document camera isn't really 240 dpi. That's what I figured it would be if what the surface you were scanning was conveniently large enough to scan a letter-sized document and not much beyond that. It can only, as I'll, we'll get to in a little bit, be less than 240 dots per inch. That's close to the maximum, unless, of course, I was actually going to raise the, um, the piece of paper to put it a little closer to the camera. One of the things that is different about a camera versus a scanner is that the distance between the paper and the surface of that and the ca camera itself is variable. It kind of depends on you. And as a consequence, the resolution is a little uncertain. 240 is a pretty good guess on our part. There's one other property that I want to get to. Each pre the doc duplex is advisable for default behavior will be used light source, not supported. Which is light source. And it says, helpfully, but in not in a very interesting way, that's not supported. Certain documents cameras come with their own lights. The hard cam actually has its own light, but I can't control it. That is, it cannot be controlled directly from the Kurzweil 1000. You can choose to turn it on or not turn it on. It's a tactically available switch at one edge of the, um, of the camera, but um, I can't control it. On the other hand, on one of the other document cameras that we uh, it plans to support in the future is called Sky, S-C-E-Y-E. -E. On that particular device, we do support the brightness. The uh, I'm sorry, not brightness. We support the, the light source. It's something you can turn on or turn off. I'll speak very briefly about Sky at the moment. I only have one of them. Um, may not be all that easily available in the United States, although noticed that Amazon supposedly now sells them. A guy is quite a bit more expensive. It's about $800. Um, the form factor is very similar. The, uh, it's light. It's simple to use. Everything should be straightforward, I hope, in many respects. Uh, it's The camera, however, instead of being a 5 megapixel camera, is a 10 megapixel camera. As a consequence, you can get to a considerably higher resolution. Basically, 300 to 400 is possible with that particular device. So it has certain things that commend it. And on the other hand, I think the price is a little high. Uh, and I just don't know that much about its availability and what kind of software it comes with. So it, we haven't worked with it that much. I do think it's going fairly popular in Europe. I already, it's made by a company in Germany, and I do expect it to be kind of an interesting device over time. So that is it for oh. scanning dialog. What I'm going to do now is useful only if you have vision, but I'm just going to show you that it's here. In the scan dialog, Star scan. at the F9. bottom of that dialog, Preview. Open the dialog. The preview. We'll turn, we'll turn that on and see what happens. Or, so what preview did, for those of you who can't see, is it brought up a dialog. The dialog simply said the name of the button, which is the Acquire button. And unlike almost all of Kurzweil 1000's dialogues, this one is resizable, and to resize, you typically would use a mouse, which, of course, is something that in the blindness business, I don't talk about much. Um, dialog shows what the camera is currently seeing. The camera is currently seeing a page. Big deal. 
Uh, to prove that, it's showing something that it can see right away. That's my hand in the page. Not very exciting. Uh, there I am. What a hover cam is, and the reason why you've got cam at the end, is it's not only a camera, it is essentially a webcam. And so it is taking pictures on a regular basis, and those pictures can be seen on the screen using preview. Now with preview, you also get a really good sense as to where to put the piece of paper that you want to scan, or the book, or the magazine, or whatever else, and exactly what you're going to see. And those of you who cannot see, the immediate and obvious question is how do you use this if in fact you can't see? And I've got two answers. One answer is kind of the cheating answer, uh, which is you go find someone who can see, and you ask them, and you look at the preview, and you set that up at least once. And the reason you do that is because now you can find out what the V in CAM T5V is. One of the things it gives you is a hinge. And that hinge to represent where the corner of a document should be. It's a kind of sticky surface on the bottom, and you can use it as a reasonably convenient way to, to always put your pages consistently in more or less the same place. Now, another thing that the T5V comes with is a, say, a uh, gray plastic pad, which again, sort of show you. I'm not using it at the time. It's fairly big. It's big enough uh, that it has some markings on it that it calls Braille. They're not really, but they're, they are nonetheless something you can tactilely feel. And when you're used to this, one of those Braille marks indicates where to put the base of the device that you're going to use for scanning or for camera capture. And all the other edges of the device give you a sense as to where to put pages of various sizes might be useful. Now I'm going to throw one other thing into this equation just to show you which that the hard cam is scalable. I would set that to a particular height that is reasonable for an eight and a half by eleven inch document. But if in fact I was scanning something like a book, I might want to see a larger surface. Now, unlike a scanner, the advantage of a larger surface is the resolution I'm going to capture will be lower. What I'm going to do at the moment is a change the height, uh, and it's the height by which the camera uh, that the camera is above this particular page. That's as high as I can go. At that height, I'm not really at 240 dots per inch anymore. I'm more like maybe 200. Um, I see a larger area, or the camera can see a larger area, that might be a really good idea if you are scanning a trade publication two pages at a time. It might be a really good idea if you're not that consistent about where you put the paper. And I'm lowering it just a little bit so that I'm within range with, of this. Now, I don't have any really great suggestions at the moment as to how you could use the telescoping feature if you cannot use the preview mode and see what it's scanning. Only say that I'm sure that people will come up with a way. I'm hopeful, in fact, that some of our retailers are already working on platforms or on uh, tactile device marks that they will put on the back of the device so that it has spots for, let's say, an ideal height for eight and a half by eleven, or you could have um, strings essentially that dangle from the unit that could give you a good sense as to where to put the document. It's a problem that I expect people will be able to solve. Some of people will be resellers, some of those people will be customers, um, and that's great. I fully expect that there will be more that we can share of how to use. In your future.
Anyway, let's get some pages. I'm going to get out of this dialog. Oh, I can hit enter and acquire within this dialog, but I'm going to get out of it because standardly, particularly if I was blind, I wouldn't be using can this. Instead, I would just use F9, which is what one normally uses, or in scan, you could use... Stop. Scan. Try new scan. F9. Start new scan. Scan. Has this menu. So, F9. Please wait. Makes that sort of funny little camera noise. It's done with scanning the page, and you can move to the next one. Please wait. Increase scanning resolution to 300 dpi or greater. Recognition is three quarters done. So I've scanned, well, three pages. Not, not a big deal. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out by doing that, and something that you'll learn very quickly using this kind of device, is it's a lot recognition easier complete. to turn the page of a rec book or to recognition complete. one particular page. The top page, of the page was at the left of the uh, scanner. The page of a uh, magazine or something like that when it is facing up. With a camera, with a scanner, I would, of course, have to lift the lid of the platen, pick up the book, turn the page, reposition the book, put the lid back down, and then hit F9. It's going to be a lot faster if what you're doing is facing up is on and is basically on the surface of the desk. So this is, if this kind of device is useful to you, it's really, really easy. Um, in many respects, that's really what scanning with a book is all about, uh, or scanning with a document camera is all about. As I said, the resolution is roughly um, 240 dots per inch. It happens that you're always scanning in color. Print F1 for help. N. For those of you who can see the surface, uh, I have just brought up the image of the page using control plus W. So you can see what the image looked like. And of course you can read within the surface. N. All 1000 unregistered trademark. Version 13. All educational systems. All Yes? Sir. You have a question? Oh, I'll just continue. I do want to mention before I forget a couple other um, changes. I've had some customers who, with limited vision but some vision, who actually tend to use image mode to do most of their reading because they like to see what they're reading as it is being read to them. They, of course, have their own zoom level. So with Control Plus, I can change the zoom level. And they point out a couple things to me was it was really annoying to have to get out of this particular um, mode when you got to the bottom of the page and want to get back into it to start the next page. Now, now you can do that. Um, well, you can just be reading and it will continue reading on the next page, as you more or less would expect in the other view. You can go to the bottom of the document with call plus rather than simply the control of the current page. Page three. Page three was there. Page one. one. Like that. Um, basically, there are a fair number of functions which now can be done um, in the image view without getting out of the image view. It, of course, automatically exit image view if, the, if a page has no image. But nonetheless, for, uh, for quite a bit of functionality, this product is now more useful for someone with limited vision who simply wants wants to be able to see what's on the screen at the same time and wants to use that as a mode of operation in general. So that now kind of works. Splitting. As in the last release, there is a split view, which is really great if you have vis someone with vision trying to clean up documents for someone else. It's actually very handy. And of course, just the text view. Uh, so that is in there as well. 
But I started with that was simply to point out that you're always essentially scanning in color when you are scanning with a hover. And that's really about it for the hover cam right now. We've talked about preview, we've talked about lighting source, we've talked about some of the changes in that dialogue. I did want to point out one other thing. You may have heard it say that you really ought to be scanning at 300 or higher if you want better resolution. It's actually a feature of the OCR engine Fine Reader, and I happen to be using Fine Reader at the moment. But of course, you don't have any choice if you're scanning with a document camera, and you undoubtedly wouldn't want to hear that message again and again. So what I'm going to do? File settings. Category. Present focus. Go to the verbosity menu. This dialogue. The dialogue has changed, and I will talk about the changes a little bit. First off, the very first category or the very first control in it is called category. It tells you about the particular, particular category of events that you might want to change with the verbosity dialogue. So the first program focus. Reading. Reading. Logs. Dialogues. Menus. Menus. Scan and recognition. Focus. Reading. Logs. So that's what I've got. Uh, basically, getting to be so many events that it made sense to break them down into categories so that you could find them a little more easily and more quickly get to what you wanted to get to. What I particularly wanted to do at the moment Men's scan and recognition. is in scanning and recognition. To modify the system response for scanner progress, press tab. So I have print print tab event. there to Press get and arrow key. Scan complete. Image capture complete. Aha! Camera image capture complete. That's new, and I hit tab. It'll tell me what I'm doing. A time will be played when the selected event occurs. The WAV file that will be played is currently camera.wav in folder C. Browse, test. The test function, let's hear what, what the WAV file sounds like. No surprise, we already heard Okay, it can apply verbosity. Great, scan and recognition. Modify the system response for camera image. Recognition progress. Recognition complete. Pet orientation information. Confidence level information. Completion of a long recognition task. Completion of audio file creation. Hints from the recognition engine. This is the last one, thank goodness, but, uh, in the scanning and recognition category. And I wanted you to know about it simply because that's the one that was uh, basically nagged me about the resolution of the device and said, you know, you probably want higher resolution if you want better OCR. There's some truth to that message, but I wouldn't want to hear it all the time if I were scanning for camera with using a camera. And so, a message will be spoken when the selected event occurs. I could if I wanted to. Disabled. Disable this particular signal. Message. And having disabled it as a consequence, just not hear it or not hear it in this particular circumstance there as well. Um, four. Let me see what else I've got. There's a Place little thing. On hover cameras. Yes, can I help you? Yeah, I, this is Sherry. I'm um, via phone. Um, I had um, a couple of questions about the hover cam. Um, I, I guess there's actually three. Um, the first is just if you could compare maybe the differences between the the hover cam type scan and the flatbed scan that we're used to. I'm I'm really out of the out of the dark for me. No pun intended because I've not even thought about cameras um, with regard to to the um, the actual computer program. And then my second question is um, how the, the the hover cam would work in large scanning um, situations like universities where we scan textbooks and manuals and we have to unbind, scan, and then rebind, um, which obviously devalues the book greatly. Um, and, and I'm assuming it means that would be obsolete. We wouldn't have to do that anymore. My third question was with regard to the, 
the tilt or how to place the pages under the camera. Um, would the hover cam have any sort of um, tilt functions like our KNFB readers do so that we could um, identify how we tilted and the percentage of tilt so that we would know next time to do it differently? Okay, uh, great questions, and let me see what I can do through them. Um, I don't think that cameras will replace scanners. Scanners have been around for a long time, relatively inexpensive, although, as you know, they can get quite expensive if you um, get one with a really big document feeder and a lot of other functionality. But scanners, first off, you are going to get a more consistent image, and often you are going to get a better image. You're going to get a higher resolution. For example, you wanted to scan um, point type in some horrible legal document, and you really needed to read the fine print. I would strongly recommend using a scanner at 600 dpi. Do not even think about using a camera device, you're simply not going to be able to see it well enough to get a high quality image. Um, having said that, cameras are great in certain circumstances. First off, they're really, really portable. There are no moving parts in a document camera. I can hold this thing up, it weighs about two pounds, it's fairly, you know, a fairly thin, you know, two foot high piece of plastic that I can stick in a knapsack and take with me. It does not need a power cord. You simply plug it in with the USB and it gets the power off the USB. So it's por highly portable, very easy to use in that regard. Um, scanners, most portable scanner, you have to deal with the fact that it does have moving parts and consequence. Consequently, has at least a lock mechanism. It's simply not the most portable of devices. As already mentioned, I think in some respects, once you're used to it, a camera can be a reasonably fast device for moving through a document. You scan, you know, a number of pages per minute. You no, know how many, but certainly 10 pages per minute is not at all hard um, because you have to turn the thing over and constantly repress it down. On the other hand, its position on its surface is very important. A camera has a lot of um, freedom of movement that you don't get out of a scanner. You always know where to position a page on a scanner. You don't necessarily know that as easily for a camera. It can be hard to do. It can take a while to learn how to do it well. But you can learn. It's not by any means bad. You mentioned a university setting, and I really sort of have two things to say. One is that I believe in a classroom, something like a hover cam is a great device to be shared by a variety of students in a classroom to get casual access to particular blocks of text that they need. Because it's really easy to learn how to use it, it's very easy to put a page down. To hit the scan button, I mean, you can figure out how to do this in a fairly simple way, and it's not particularly delicate. It is a robust device fairly well. Interesting sound effects. So, from that perspective, it's a nice device. It can be used great in a classroom. Also, some I haven't mentioned about Hovercam yet, you can download from the website that you, uh, is available for, with a hover cam, some software that is completely free that gives you all sorts of other functionality and basically, among other things, gives you a nice way to have a, um, you know, a school-wide projector system, for example. So you can use this as a replacement for your opaque projector in a classroom. It can be a nice device. Having said that, you really mentioned a sort of document center where you are Ring the, the box off of bindings, putting a document in a document feeder and a book in a document feeder and scanning it that way. Yes, it costs you a copy of the book to do that by reducing the value of the book. But it's 
going to still be a lot faster and a lot easier and probably somewhat better recognition than okay. if you were to use a document camera to do the same thing. Uh, okay. With document camera, that would take, you know, real size book. It would probably take a matter of a couple hours to finish the scanning. By hand with document camera, and really, that's the time that you're saving by using a guillotine to take the binding off the book and a high-end scanner to do the uh, the document use with a document theater. Right. This does not replace that. But there are circumstances, partly due to portability, partly due to simply the ease of use, um, how quickly I can turn a page, um, some aspects which make these things sort of better. Answer all your questions, or is there something else? Um, thank you for that. For for all that, especially the the um, book binding issue, because I'm always looking for ways for our university to save money for students with disabilities in voc rehab. So, um, but thank you for explaining that. Um, my my third question was just about um, the tilt function that that we use with our K and SB readers. As we're tilting our camera, it kind of gives us feedback. And I was just wondering if the hover cam has anything like that, or if there would be any way to build that into our Kurzweil 1000 eventually. So, yes, and I'm sorry I forgot to answer that. Uh, it's one of the things that I did not do. It is something that makes a great deal of sense to do. Now, tilt itself, well, actually, tilt does have some value because you've got skew. Uh, you have another kind of tilt in a camera that you hold in your hand, which is that you're not, the camera isn't necessarily parallel with the surface of the book. That problem goes away because what you've got here is a camera on a stand, oh. and stand is basically at a fixed view. However, you still have what's called skew, which is basically that the paper can be de can be skewed relative to the position of the camera. Right now, you would get that kind of information um, really only visually. There is no, I think, called it a field of view report, if I'm not mistaken. Something like that ought to be done for this device, and I fully intend to get to that, but I do not have a date when it will be available. But that would be a great feature to have. It would be very useful. Thank you so much. Sure. Other questions? I'm going to unmute people that I've muted in case there are questions. Okay. Any other questions? Are you for me? No, I'm just asking if there are questions so far. Well, oh, Stephen, I think you can go on. Okay. In many respects, I don't have much more to say. There are, of course, things I've forgotten, I am sure. Uh, one thing I do want to talk about briefly is that we added support for a new kind of voice. It turns out in a rather mysterious way, frankly, Microsoft supported a lot of new voices or created a lot of new voices in some project which came out of one of their labs and was called the Microsoft Speech Platform Runtime 11. There has to be a website where you can get it, you can download it, you can look at a license agreement for it. And basically, you don't have to do any of that because that is on the DVD, and it is a DVD now that this product comes on. It's not, however, automatically installed, and in fact, the setup won't get you to it. But if you were to explore that particular DVD, you would find it has a folder called Microsoft Speech. Inside of that folder, there is another setup. And basically, that setup program lets you install one or more of a number of different voices. The voices are in the following languages German, English, Spanish, Finnish, French, Italian, Norwegian, Dutch, Polish, Portuguese, and Russian. 
So you could install one or any of those if you wanted to. One of the things that I found particularly fun uh, is that under English, there are actually um, some regional differences. So if you wanted to, you could install an Australian English voice. There's also a Canadian English voice, a British English voice, an Indian English voice, and as it turns out, two American English voices. I think what I've got here is Unfortunately, just one of the American English. Let me just File. find it. Has a sub menu. Settings. Voices. Review or change reading voice settings. Selected speech engine is voice where? Microsoft. That is Microsoft. This voice is Microsoft and. And is an old voice. It's been around for a long time. Pro. Europe Pro is one of the new voices, and I happen to like it. It's actually a pretty nice voice. And listen to what it sounds like. And Kurzweil 1000 trademark. 13. While oh. educational systems. Kurzweil 1000 is award-winning software that makes printed or electronic text accessible. Now, let me speed this up a lot, because that's one of the things I like about this voice. 100, 240, 200, 300. Okay, let's say 300. Accessible to people who are blind, visually impaired. It enables communication and productivity, tools to ease and enhance the reading, writing, and learning experience. Cruise 1000 delivers quick access to virtually any content, including online books, magazines, dictionaries, and encyclopedias, so readers can pursue the interests they desire. 1000 version 13 new features. So it took a while to get used to, but this is an example of sort of what are the quality of the kind of quality you get from these new voices. Uh, and really, they're pretty remarkable voices. They are not bad at all. Um, one of my beta testers is, uh, is a professor of linguistics. And after listening to one of these voices in uh, some language other than English for a while, I forget which voice, he said one of the things he particularly liked about it is that finally somebody had figured out that human beings breathe when they talk, and consequently they have to pause now and then if only to breathe. And a voice can sound rather unnatural by not pa pausing at appropriate moments in order to do that. And he said the voice he was listening to paused very well. It did that nicely. So that's kind of a new feature. It's, uh, it's sort of fun. Now, as I mentioned, these are delivered by DV on a DVD now. So you no longer get lots of different uh, discs. And everything that was on previous series is now instead on the DVD. And you can explore that particular folder and find other things. Yes? This is not a major thing, but since I'm here, I will show it, which is... File. Has a menu. Apply conditions. The word defined is new. What's the word? Platform. Part of speech will be... This will be American. One platform. Noun. Noun. Level surface raised above the level of the adjacent area as a stage for public speaking or landing alongside railroad tracks. Tracks. Such as a submarine... I'm speaking rather quickly here, but the main reason I'm showing this is unlike the way this worked before, I can stop and start anywhere in this. It works more or less like a document. That's true for a number of dialogues in Kurzweil 1000 now. They don't stop. If, they have a, if there is a lengthy message that could be read, you can use it more or less as though you were in a document. So that's kind of a subtlety, but it's a nice little improvement. Mm -hmm. That is about it for me. Are there other questions? I'll mute again so people can ask questions if they have them. Could you tell us how to upgrade from our from our current versions? Sure, I can answer that. Actually, we leave that with you. I'll be back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you currently own version 12, and if you buy it, 
before, hold on, let me get the date. If you bought it on or before June 15, 2011, <coughs> you will get the upgrade. Um, you will get a free upgrade. If you have registered your product, you will start to get the upgrade correct from us. Um, and approximately, I think it's four or five weeks. If you have product, before. June 15, 2011, um, the, the upgrade cost is $125. Hmm. Okay. At the, end of, at, at the end of the webinar, I will um, I can tell you, I can leave you with some, an email address to contact customer service or a number to call us. Any questions? Yes. yes. Uh, my name is Larry Lumpkin. We're in Austin. I would like to ask Stephen if uh, what our engine has he found that has made most improvements on reading a cookbook. Thank you. Steve, you hear the question? Stephen, have we lost you? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> did you did you hear the question? I'll step out of the office for a moment. What was the question? Uh, uh, the question was, um, Larry, would you like to repeat the question? Hi, Larry. This is your building engineer sure. once again. Just to remind you, we have finished our water repair. I'm sorry, Marcel. Okay. <laughs> Larry. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Stephen, this is Larry in Austin. Uh, Susan, and she loves cookbooks. And we wanted to know uh, in what, which of the two engines do you think has offered the most improvement in, in reading of, of uh, cookbooks? Thank you. Sorry. Um, I actually haven't scanned a cookbook um, in a while. As I recall, in the past, I would have tended to recommend ScanSoft. By the way, there's one other place where I recommend ScanSoft. If you want really fast recognition of a PDF file that is already accessible, i.e. one that already has text in it, um, ScanSoft is blindingly fast at that. Uh, Fine Reader is somewhat slower. Um, so in general, ScanSoft used to be better with things that included a lot of fractions, which was one of the problems with cookbooks. Let me point out, though, another problem with cookbooks is that sometimes people do a lot of pretty lines in cookbooks, and sometimes they deliberately use fonts that look like handprint or handwriting that are nearly impossible to scan well. Uh, so recognition can be problematic, and I can't answer your question as to this specific version and how it does in cookbooks. But it's really a question that you can, uh, as you learn more, as you learn more about it through perhaps personal experience, you can tell us. Yes, I'll do that for sure. We missed the first part of your web honor because we didn't. Instructions on on how to how to get in or or to use the tool. Uh, uh, we're hoping that you'll put it up. up. It's so that I can get the first fifteen minutes. Uh, Larry, yeah, we, we, sorry, Stephen. Yes, Larry, we are we have we are recording this webinar, and we'll send out a follow up email, and it will have a link to the recorded version of this webinar. We're also repeating the webinar on Tuesday. At 10 in the morning, um, that would have been in the email that you received from us yesterday, I'm seeing version 13. And so I will also put a link in into the, to the next version of the webinar, which will be a repeat of this one on Tuesday. So you can join us again if you'd like to, Larry. Anybody else? Okay. Are any other questions? One. Yes. Yeah. 
Pat Seed from Canada, and um, I am involved in the music ministry in our parish. And one of the things that is very difficult to do is to get the words from the music, um, from a sheet of music. Is there any way that we can do that using Kurzweil 13? Oh, interesting problem. Um, Kurzweil, I think you're still going to have quite a problem. Like letters, to a certain extent, and distinguishing between them is not just sort of part of the problem set that these things were designed to solve. There have been in the past, although I don't know much about them, certain devices that, or certain pieces of software that were oriented towards scanning and recognizing music. I actually don't know how they do in the text associated with the music. But that's maybe the first place I'd look at. Is look for, um, say, on the Internet, look for scanning music. You find, I think, a couple small companies that deal with that. And you might very well want to ask them that question because uh, I'm not entirely sure that they focused exactly on that problem, but they might have. Thank you. Any other questions before we close out? Hi, this is Larry. Just another quick one, if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead. Hi, Stephen. It's uh, uh, going to be possible. Uh, I will get the CD, but people are asking me, I think, and I see on the list. Is uh, the company going to offer a downloadable uh, path upgrade? Thank you. Um, it, it, you know, I mean, I can, there are, first off, the DVD is now 1.9 gigabytes, so we're talking a fair big download. Um, it is nonetheless possible, and it's even probable that we'll do that with the demo. We'll do that with the actual product. Um, the principal issue would be, uh, to make really, really certain that the online registration experience is something that um, couldn't use an old serial. Well, you know, the fact is there is a serial number that comes with the product. With the serial number, you can do registration and your account. Uh, and for very, really pretty good reasons, we want you to use your old serial number in doing of that. In order to make this all possible, we would want to be very, very careful that our own um, software on the other side that's handling that particular transaction is able to know whether or not an upgrade has been purchased. And I'm not absolutely convinced that that's been done. Uh, so that's one reason why we would tend not to do that in the past. However, a downloadable demo is something that we will absolutely do. Of course, demo works just like a full product for a month. It's a bad approach. Thank you very much. That's a very good explanation. And uh, I get the demo and, and, and you get and look forward to having my own. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I'd like to leave you all, though, with a few, a uh, little bit of information so that you can find out more about Kurzweil 1000 and our new version. If you, you can go to our website, which is kurzweiledu.com. You can contact customer service by calling 800-547-6747. That's 800-547-6747. Or email customer service at ambiumlearning.com. That's C as in Charlie, A, M as in Mary, B as in way, I, U, M as in Mary, learning.com. And uh, we, are, we are running a special. If you would like to buy, if you don't own Kurzweil 1000 right now, you can buy it for $100 off for only $890. So like 
license and do that through our online store, which you'll also find on our website, whileedu.com. Are there any questions about any of that information that I just gave? Add as, add as, as a kind of my own closing, uh, two things. One is that this product has been a long, around for a long time. It is uh, almost the definition of what a mature product looks like. Having said that, products are never really done, period. They are always works in progress. They can always been, be improved. There are, are always new ideas that can be incorporated in them. And of course, the environment around them changes. And so the definition of exactly what they would do in the scenario circumstances also changes over time. Um, secondly, products, um, the creation of a product ideally is something that is done with active participation at, of the customers, of the people who actually use the product. Um, I have customers who basically spend much of their day using Kurzweil 1000. Needs to say, I may think about Kurzweil 1000 a fair amount, but I don't actually use it all day long. And these people are uniquely qualified to have ideas and experiences that can help to make the product better. General, I am always interested in those ideas. You can use the Kurzweil 1000 listserv, which I actively read and participate in, um, to uh, to send me information. And you can also, of course, do that with an email address, which is uh, Steve dot Baum at Cambium Tech C A M B I U M T E C H dot com. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you for coming.